Good morning, Mountain View. Guys, thank you so much for coming out to the new 830 service. My wife's prayer this morning was, Lord, spread them out like peanut butter and jelly <laughs> over the three services. I'm sitting there going, wow, this is more than I expected. And I'm just so thankful that God, as I look at the 43,000 in Culpeper that don't call any church home anywhere on any given Sunday morning, that we're making a little more room in all the different services that we invite and invest in those who walk far from Christ have a place to invite them to come. So thank you for doing this and helping us out. Well, you see the theme behind me, and this is something I've been working on for a while. I've been marinating on this. God is big enough. Now, we like that word God and really big, but oftentimes this word here is not big enough in our lives. We like the word big. We like big deals. We like big buffets. We like big houses and big cars and big elections. We just, everybody likes something big. When it comes to your children, if you had the privilege of raising kids or thought about this, or maybe nieces or nephews, and you ever walked up, walked up to a kid and said, or to a child, kid, that's kind of not fair, you know, to a child and said, how big do you want to be when you grow up? And a child gets there and he, he just looks, it's all wide-eyed on you and gets up on a chair and then stands up on that chair and says, Mommy or Daddy, when I get older, I want to be this big. And in that moment, I don't think any parent would ever look at that child and say, I'm sorry, kid, I'm only 5'1", your daddy's 5'3", it's not in the cards for you. <laughs> we would never do that. We would never do that. But here's a challenge. We want them to know that what they think about themselves matters. But there's something else about this word big that we want people to know. It's something we should already know, especially if you're in this room and you profess faith in Jesus Christ, that the size of your God really does matter. Okay? And so that's where we're going for the next three weeks. If you and I live on a daily basis, and it's been all of us at one point or another, that live with a shrunken, emaciated, shriveled up view of God, then we're going to live in a constant state of fear because we're going to believe that everything depends on me. That's where we ultimately get to. If our God is not big enough, we will not, we will pray without faith. We will worship without awe. We will serve without joy. And we will live our lives and we will suffer without hope. And in that moment, we will result, this result in a life of stagnation and fear with very little capacity to weather the storms and the trials that come our way on a daily basis. Some of you know that. I know that personally. I remember being in a marriage retreat, and this is some things we're modeling after this couple that we met at a wedding, and they have a ministry in Fredericksburg, and they've been doing marriage ministry for 30 years. And I took some of our marriage mentors with us to visit this couple in their home, and she was so on fire for God, and I could tell why their marriage ministry is so powerful. And in the middle of all of us adults, she got in the middle of us adults and said, how big is your God? I'm like, what, are we in youth group or something? How big is your God? And she walked around the middle of the circle, and she said, you remember this whole thing? My God is so big. Remember this? My go ahead and say it with me. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. She was marching around the mill, that circle. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what is she doing? She's freaking out. I'll never forget that day. Because her God to her was really, really big. So remember, you remember that. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. What I want to do today or an attempt to do is to show you what a life with a shriveled up, emaciated God looks like. But also, as God makes himself known to men and or women, and they begin to grow in their capacity to have a big God, what life can also look like. To do that, I want to take you way back into the Old Testament. If you want your Bibles open, I encourage you, or your iPhones or iPad, doesn't matter, go ahead and open them up to the book of Judges. Very early on in the Old Testament, in chapter 6 of Judges, Israel was in a transition season. The patriarchs, the Abrahams, the Moses, the Joshuas, they had passed on. Israel didn't have a king yet. And so in this interim time, when they would get in trouble, God would raise up judges. These were men and women he would raise up to lead the people of Israel out of their problems. And on one such occasion, God's people were in bondage to this group called the Midianites. And they were crying out to God, help us. And God heard their cries. It's almost like God said, I'll be right back. 
I got to go get somebody. And he goes and he finds an individual that he was going to raise up to lead his people out of the bondage they were in. And his name was Gideon. Some of you are familiar with this and some of you aren't. So I encourage you to follow along with me, maybe in a way you've never heard this before. In the Bible, in Judges chapter 6, the word of God says that the angel of the Lord, often referring to that pre-incarnate, that pre-birth Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus has always been. Jesus didn't show up just in Bethlehem. I mean, many times it's referring to that pre-incarnate. I'm using that big word, Christ. But it says, the angel of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah. It belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now here, Gideon is, okay, mighty warrior. I'm not so sure about this angel of the Lord. I mean, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. Okay, you're supposed to thresh wheat out into the fields where the wind can help bring the chaff away from the grain. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be done. I mean, you can thresh wheat in a wine press, but that's kind of like making coffee in a thimble. You can do it, but why? All right, so in this moment, I'm realizing, hey, maybe it's not so um, the Superman hero that we're looking for here. He's terrified by the Midianites. In this moment, Gideon's God was really not big enough, okay? So we can relate to him. And I started thinking about this, going, you know what? When you and I live with a not big enough God, you and I live in a world without dreams. I'll just tell you that from experience. When we have a God that is not big enough in our heart and mind, we will live on a daily basis in a life without dreams or possibilities. Nothing's ever going to change. You see, our habits, our failures, our flaws, our relationships, these are our Midianites, and we can't seem to overcome them. They are too big for us. What do I do with it? The Bible says in Judges 6, 14 and 15, said this, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Oh, okay, so there's all these 12 tribes of Israel, and I'm the least of the tribes, and we're the least clan, and I'm the least in my family. I'm off the hook, God. Find somebody else. And we do the exact same thing. Don't you realize, God, my God is not very big at this moment. He's almost saying, hey, angel, have you seen that my God is not big enough, the one I carry around with me? I can't do what you're asking. It's almost like somehow Gideon was thinking, God, you want me to go out in my charisma? You want me to go out in my skills and my talent and my, my past experience? And you want me to save Israel? I can't do that. But that's not what God asked him to do. The Bible said in 14, actually in verse 16, he said, the Lord answered, this is what we need to hear. I will be with you. I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And I got this image, and I, of course, I'm not a carpenter, you know, but I saw, I thought, how am I going to do this and show the screens? I really wanted to create a door up here. Some of those doors that you see, the one that came to mind was Chick fil A, but any kind of a place where it has those swivel doors from the back of the building. Everybody does Chick fil A on Sundays because we can't have it. You know, so we have that swivel door that goes back and forth on a hinge, you know, from the back of the warehouse or the cooks to the front line. So imagine that type of door for a minute. And so I had this image in my mind, and I said, oftentimes we see that door, and we live behind the door in our own little wine presses. And we all do it, and I do it as well. We got this little wine press, and my God's not very big, and I'm comfortable here, and I'm safe here, and I'm hiding behind my door. And my door is like, and on that door, remember that door has a swing somehow, and it has a hinge. And that door has a hinge, and oftentimes that hinge, we think it's our education and our skills and our talents and our habits. But we also recognize oftentimes that hinge is our failures and our faults and our sin, our, our sin and sometimes that hinge can get bound and you can't open. And many times we'll live behind that door, and I, I wrote these words down for myself, oftentimes on the inside of the door, inside of our little wine press, we'll write words like undoable or unthinkable. 
But on the outside of the door, our God is knocking and he's writing words like unstoppable and immeasurable. So inside our wine press, all we can see is the unthinkable and the undoable. God on the outside can see the immeasurable and the unstoppable. And yet we can't open the door. The only thing I thought changes it for me is we realize that hinge up there, although we have all that garbage that we say, we, you know, I've tried, I can't do it anymore. Or my sin, I'm, I'm always failing at that certain sin or that certain temptation. I can't push through that. And God looks at us, and when he asks us to do something, he says, I will be with you. And the hinge changes, or he greases that hinge. He says, my presence and my power will give you the capacity to, to break through the unthinkable, to begin to experience the immeasurable. But that's something you and I have to do on a daily basis. And when Gideon's God and his understanding that God was big enough grew inside of him, he broke through that unthinkable and undoable into the unimaginable and the immeasurable. And the Bible says this. You think it's hard. So he does this, and he takes God's word seriously, and he goes and does what God says. But what God said wasn't easy. Verse 25 and 26, that same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that's seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a, a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of, his, on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole then, that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Now can you imagine for a second, it's almost like, okay God, wait a second. You know the first thing is a little bit hard, this is getting harder. You want me to go around and tear down my father's phallic poles, basically, is what they were, to the goddess Asherah? And then you want me to tear down his, his um, sex and religion shrine that he set up to the god Baal, that they do all kinds of ungodly sexual acts inside that, all to hopefully have a better harvest next season? You want me to do that? Yep. And his response wasn't, well, I'm looking at my hinge, God, and my skills, and my talents, and my experience, and my sin, and my fault. He looked at hinge and saw, my God is with me. And he broke through the unthinkable and the unimaginable into the, un, the absolutely measurable and, the, and God, God size. And he did it. God's faith was big enough. Gideon's faith was big enough. And the cool thing was that after he did this, he built an altar and he sacrificed the bull. When his dad got up the next day, he didn't throw a fit. He looked at the rest of the people that were angry and said, look, if Baal is God... Baal take care of himself. He was almost inspired by his son's faith and capacity to believe in God and do what God asked him to do. And so then God does what he often does to your life and mine, that when we take an opportunity and we see God work in our lives, and okay, I'm done, that's all I really need, God. I just got a little bit bigger wine press now. God says, I want to challenge you to something bigger. I want you to relieve, I want you to pull God's people, my people, out of the hands of the Midianites. I want you to take on all of the Midian army. Um, okay. That's his response. I'll do it. He wanted to show Gideon just how big he truly was. And then the Bible says, God said to Gideon, if you will save, Gideon, excuse me, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you've promised. Now, I love this. Look at the text on the screen. It's almost like he knew what God said, but he just couldn't believe it. Okay, God, let's get this straight. If you will save Israel by my hand, um, okay, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I want to say he just couldn't, couldn't keep going that direction. If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And this is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full, full of water. This is where many people, secular, sacred alike, we get that phrase, I want to set a fleece out. And we've all done it. We all would, sometimes people say it's, it's used to discern the will of God. I'll be honest with you, I don't call this a mature act. Matter of fact, in this case, it was a rather mature, immature act because God had already told him that this was his battle. He was going to save Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. He just wanted to, wanted to get in to cooperate with them. And so many times what happens in the same we throw fleeces out is that we're not doing this by faith. We're trying to manipulate God. Imagine this for a second. Somebody comes to your work tomorrow morning. 
and they've got a bag of 12 or 13 baker's dozen of donuts from Kanako's Bakery. And they're stuffing their face with them. And you say, well, wh- where'd you get all those? He said, let me tell you what happened. I was driving down Davis Street on the work today, and I just heard God say to me, I'm supposed to eat Kanako's donuts today. And so he thought, surely, God, do you want me to eat Kanako's donuts today? Well, God, if that is of you, then I'll tell you what, I'm going to throw a fleece before you. That as I'm driving down Davis Street today, if there is a parking spot right in front of Kanako's Bakery open, then I'm going to believe that is of you, and that I'm going to stop and get a dozen donuts. And then pause happens in the break room as you're watching this guy stuff his face with the donuts. And then the guy's like, really? Are you serious? Pretty popular place. Are you telling me that there was a parking spot open right in front of Kanakos? And the guy looks at him and says, well, not the first time, but my fifth time around the block, there was one open in front of Kanakos. <laughs> Folks, that's not faith. That's manipulation. <laughs> and that's often what we do when it comes to hearing the voice of God. And so I don't really encourage that. But he did what God asked him to do. And so he goes out and he gathers up an army of Israelites to take on the Midianites. He has 32,000 of them. The problem was is that Midians had 135,000 in their army. So he's thinking, okay, God, whew, these odds aren't good. This is like four to one, okay? Four to one odds. And, and the Bible says that God comes to Gideon. Now, this is my paraphrase. This God comes to Gideon and says, um, Gideon, you have a numbers problem. And Gideon's like, thank you, Jesus, for recognizing this. You know, of course I have a numbers problem. They've outnumbered me four to one. He says, no, you don't have too few. You have too many. And then he looks at Gideon and he says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to look at your army and I want you to ask every one of the people in the army if they are afraid, I want them to go home. <laughs> afraid? They just left their families and their children and their farms, and they're going to go to war with a, a, an army that outnumbers them. Of course they're all afraid. But how big is your God? I'll do it. He looks at them, and 22,000 of them go home. I got 10,000 left. Some of you guys can do the math. That's 13 to 1. He thinks, okay, my God's big enough. And then God comes to him and says, you still have too many. I want you to take your army down to the water, and I want you to observe them. And those that actually kneel and cup the water and lap like a dog are to be separated from those that get down on all fours and drink right from the water. Those that actually knelt and lap like a dog, I want you to separate them. That's going to be your army. You send the rest home. And there was only 300 people left. Now, I'm not going to spend the time to help understand because there's so many complexities, and we really ultimately don't know the choosing. There's some fascinating reasons maybe why, but that's not the point. The point is now that my odds have now moved to what? It's on the screen. 450 to 1. How big is your God? And in this moment, as I'm processing this, God's coming to him saying, look, this is my battle. So 300 men, no swords, just lanterns or lights on a stick and a bunch of clay pots surround the Midianite army at night and rout them. Do you hear me? 300 people with a light and a clay pot. Was this his battle? No. Whose battle was it? It was God's battle. Because that's what he promised. If you come outside of your little bitty wine press, I'm going to show you the unthinkable. I'm going to show you the immeasurable. Why? Not because you're big enough, Mark. Not because you're big enough, Gideon. Because I'm big enough. And oftentimes, we have anxiety, but there was no anxiety there. Just peace. And I thought to myself, what about us here? Does anybody here ever wrestle with worry or fear? Be honest. Lion, say 30, because you're in church. <laughs> you ever wrestle with anxiety or fear? An article came out in the New York Times a couple of years ago. And I found it fascinating. It said scientists were working on the human genome project that identified what they called the worry gene. It's fascinating. It said, I'm not making this stuff up. It's the SLC684 gene on chromosome 17Q12. Now, I'm just telling you what you already knew. I'm sure everybody, every day, you're talking about chromosome 17Q12. I find this fascinating. 
Because as they're studying this gene, they begin to understand something. People that have the short version of that gene, they say, are especially prone to worry. Now, how many of you right now are sitting in this room going, man, I just got shafted by the short end of that gene? <laughs> Forget the short end of the stick. I got the short end of the gene. And I thought, wow, people especially prone to worry. And I think to myself sometimes, that's me. Sometimes I think I have the long end, a really long end, and sometimes I'm not quite sure the gene is there at all. Josh talked about having a meeting tonight at the church, at the sanctuary here, 630, where we're talking about the direction we believe Mountain View's take, God's taking Mountain View in this, into the future. And I wrote these things down, and I said, God is leading us. Where are you leading us, oh God, as we flip the calendar in 2017? What we're going to share about tonight is a whole lot of vision, but let me tell you, it's a whole lot of unknowns. There are times when I'm temp tempted to be overwhelmed by all the stuff I think I've got to do. I sit in my basement office and I think about all the opportunities before me that I don't know how to capture, all the problems that I don't know how to solve, and all the outcomes that I simply can't control. My kids' futures, my relationships, the ministry of Mountain View, land and buildings and a different view, and sometimes I just sat there and I'm typing this and I'm sitting back in my chair and hearing God say, Mark. I really am big enough. I really am big enough. Mark, I own what you can't control. I own what you can't control. Trust me. I hope you'll come out tonight because I want to share vision for Mountain View, and many others are going to help me do that. And honestly, we have a proposed budget for this coming year that is, exceeds what we have this year. It's God-sized. But to be honest with you, I don't even think what God has in store for Mountain View can be contained in that budget from what I've experienced in 2016. Sometimes God will invite us to do what we've written on the back of the door in our little wine press. It's undoable. It's unthinkable. But on the outside of that door, God has written something that you and I can't see yet, the unimaginable and the immeasurable. And we'll never see it until you and I push through the door of that wine press and join God in what he's doing. And we'll never do that until we hear God say, I'm big enough. But sometimes we can't hear that, even in times of prayer, even in times of Bible study. Sometimes God's got to bring somebody else along. And God works through experiences. He works through people. Sometimes you'll hear through a spouse. Sometimes you'll hear through a friend. And sometimes you hear through a child. Today, I want you to hear from one of my daughters, or one of our daughters, Megan who in just seven weeks will fly the coop as she graduates high school. I realize that you have 930. Remember that bubble gum? Some of you remember you have like 930 weeks between birth and graduation. And for me, I've gotten down to seven. Seven gumballs in that little jar. But I want you to hear what God is doing in her life and how God is making himself known to her. I want you to listen with your eyes. I want you to listen with your ears. Maybe God will speak to you too. You know, I have a confession to make. I thought I was big enough. I've spent so much time trying to control these little pieces of my life, you know, my hopes and my dreams, everything I want for my future, my relationships, my money. And what I found is that this is empty and it brings us to a place of brokenness. What God has been trying to teach me over this past year is, Megan Jenkins, you are not cut out to be God. And so that's where I found myself this past summer. You know, I was in a place where I was really hurting from trying to control all my circumstances around me. And so I came to a point where I was like, God, I am done. I am so done. I want you to break my heart for what breaks yours, no matter the cost. You do what it takes to work in me. Well, several weeks after I prayed that prayer, I remember I went to talk to my mom and I was like, Mom, I just do not know what I want to do with my life anymore. I have no idea. You know, I thought I knew. I thought I had all these plans. But God is changing everything, and I, I'm so confused. I really don't know. And she said, Megan, you know, I've been thinking about it. What if you graduate in December, and then in January you go to a YWAM discipleship training school, and you just focus in on the Father and just pursue him and what he wants for your life? 
Now, for those of you who don't know, YWAM is a Christian organization that stands for Youth with a Mission. And basically what they do is throughout the thousands of schools they have all over the world, they train up young people to be disciples for Christ. And then they send them out into the nations just to love others like Jesus loved and to spread the gospel. Well, when my mom brought this idea up to me, I was like, mm -mm. oh, no, 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 no way. Mom, we just found out that my grades qualify me for a full ride scholarship to Liberty. But only if I'm here this second semester to apply for it. And you know that I'm up for a job promotion, and you know that leadership at Chick-fil-A looks good on any job resume. <laughs> now, this may not seem that big to you, but for a high school senior, these are things that really solidify life's plans. And I was like, Mom, I'm not leaving my friends and my family and the life I know. Mm, no way. But it stuck in my mind. And so a couple weeks later, I was like, okay, you know, what harm is it? So I looked up, you know, why we're in discipleship training schools. And one of the first ones that popped up was a Compassion BTS in Los Angeles. Well, I clicked on the description, and the first sentence that struck my eyes was, we ask God to break our hearts for what breaks his. I said, well, that's just a coincidence. It has nothing to do with me. I just wanna, <laughs> let's just move on. There's no way. A couple of weeks later, it was still in my mind, and so I pulled the Gideon, and I was like, pardon me, God but I am not cut out for this. Like, I am weak. I'm not even gonna be an official adult until February. You want me to go all the way across the country by myself? I don't think so, uh-uh. <laughs> but again, it was in my mind, and so I did what Gideon did, and immature or not, I laid out my pleas for God, and I said, God, if this is what you want me to do, you have to show me. Well, the next day, I'm driving to work, and let me tell you, the Lord rocked my world. And he brought me back to something that happened to me two years ago that I thought was crazy at the time, and so I hadn't thought about it since. And two years ago, after a youth group one night, Garrett Payne, if you know him, great guy, he came up to me and he said, you know, the Lord gave me a vision that I need to share with you. Really? Vision? I don't, I don't think so. But anyways, <laughs> go ahead. He said, I see this wrecked city. You know, it's ruined, it's falling apart, it's destroyed. And through this city, there's a tornado blowing through, and everything in its path has been restored. <clears throat> what? <laughs> okay, first of all, tornadoes do not restore, they destroy. And second of all, you're crazy. <laughs> but fast forward two years, and the Lord is like, Megan, don't you see? You are that wrecked city. You've spent so much time trying to control every little area of your life that you have basically destroyed yourself. And what I want to do is, like that tornado, I want to come through your life, and I want to turn your world upside down. And yes, you may have to lay things down at my feet, but it's so that I can build my kingdom in you. And so I said, okay, God, you know, fine, if this is what you want. So several weeks later, I was accepted to the school, and I got the acceptance packet, and here I am still struggling with these things. Like, God, you really want me to give up these things? Like, full ride, leadership position, Really? I get the acceptance packet and I scroll down to the bottom to the financial area. I skipped everything else. <laughs> come to find that it's more expensive than I thought it was going to be. And I was like, oh, come on, God. Who do you think you are? What are you doing? Well, you know, I was, I was mad at that point. So I'm scrolling up to the top. I'm like, God, this, this, this cannot be right. And you know, I start reading through and I get to the point where the school leader is like, our theme verse for this school is Isaiah 61.4. And it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. No, my child, who do you think you are? See, out of the thousands of schools and the thousands upon thousands of verses in the Bible, the one place the Lord has led me to focuses on renewing the ruined cities, that same city from that crazy, strange vision that I thought would never apply to my life. And so, you know, we may have these plans, and they may be good plans, but if we're not allowing God to fight our battles and control our life, then it's not the best. So, you know, I continue to pray, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours, and Lord, help me to give you control. So now, you know, I'm gonna have to pick up my guitar. It's gonna be an awkward pause, don't mind that. <laughs> I 
know these aren't just my prayers. I know there are other people that are seeking to have you break their hearts to look like yours. And I know that there are other people who want you to control. That's why I said, God, give me the words. And so while, while I play this, I just encourage you to know, think about the areas in your life where you may not be allowing God to fight your battles, where you may not be giving him that full control. i yeah. 
you know, at the beginning I told you I thought I was big enough. <coughs> I'm not. But my God is, and yours is too. I hope God is speaking to each of you. Thank you, Megan. Through that. I know he is to me. Gideon, when he first heard from God, and he was living with a shriveled, emaciated view and knowledge of God, when that God finally grew within him, the very first thing he did, which I didn't say, was that he built an altar. And the Bible says he called it, the Lord is peace. The peace wasn't the absence of the conflict and the challenge and the trial that was to come. The peace was a gift of the presence of the living God inside of Gideon to be able to take on anything that he was to face tomorrow. Same is true for Megan. Same is true for me. Same is true for you. The day you come to a place where you say, Jesus, I am desperate for the presence of God to dwell in my life, that will be the day where you build your altar of peace and step out of that shriveled up little wine press out of the unthinkable, out of the undoable into the unthinkable, out of the impossible into the immeasurable. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to break through that door because my God is big enough and yours is as well. Let's pray together. Father, I praise and I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent the angel of the Lord to Gideon. You have sent Lord Jesus Christ to us, your son. And his very last words there before he returned to the Father, to you in heaven, Lord, was he said, and lo, I am with you always until the very end of the age. Lord, each and every one of us, Lord, in this place, that have known you personal, God, who have believed in you by faith, Lord God, we have, should have already developed and built the altar of peace. That we will not reign, that, that fear and anxiety will not reign in us, but the peace of Christ, because the presence of Christ is large and in charge in our lives. But God, maybe there are some in this room today that need to hear Jesus say to you, maybe you're here right now and you need to hear Jesus say, I'm bigger than your problems. I'm bigger than your failures. I'm bigger than your opportunities. You need to hear him say, open the door of your heart. Right now, though, on the inside, you're saying, it's impossible God can't love me. It's unimaginable that he can use me. But you need to hear him say, open the door of your heart. And walk out into the realm of the immeasurable, of what only God can do. If you're in this place right now, and you've never opened the door of your little wine press, your life to God, then I challenge you where you sit to say, I'm done. I believe that my God is big enough. I believe that the Jesus he sent is big enough to save me of my sin. I believe that the forgiveness of God is big enough to overcome all of the damage I've done from the sin and the transgressions of my past. I believe that Jesus is big enough for me. My friends, I encourage you right where you sit to pray that prayer, believing that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. Believe him by faith. Receive him into your heart and ask him to be the leader of your life. Father, do what only you can do. And as we stand, Lord God, and as we sing, may this be a time of response. Whether we sit in prayer, we come forward to talk, or we come forward to pray, whatever it is, Lord, would you speak to us and may we respond to you. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name.